children with special needs are challenged by the changes that a new school year brings. EP's annual back to school issue presents a helpful selection of resources, guidance, tips, and methods to ease the transition back to school. Read it today at www.epmagazine.com. Oscar Mike Radio is a proud podcast partner of Reads Across America Radio. Heard every Thursday at 11 a.m. and Sunday at 8 a.m. Eastern. They're also big supporters of the nonprofit I Got Your Six, Two Lives at Once. And with every wreath you sponsor through Oscar Mike Radio, $5 goes back to this great organization dedicated to making a difference in the lives of veterans, law enforcement, firefighters, and first responders battling PTSD. Two Lives at Once pairs these brave men and women together with dogs rescued from kill shelters. In this way, two lives are saved at the same time by saving each other. Donate now. Go to wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio to help. That's wreathsacrossamerica.org slash Oscar Mike Radio. Suicide is preventable, and each of us has a role to play in suicide prevention. Suicide is complex. There is no single cause, and it's not always a mental health issue. It could be loss of a job or home, financial or relationship issues, pain, or leaving the military. Suicide does not discriminate. It affects all ages, races, and genders, veterans or not. If you know a veteran who is struggling, connect with them. Let them know help is available. There is quick and easy access to services in times of crisis. Dial 988, then press 1. Talking about it is okay. Don't keep it inside. Don't be ashamed. Don't wait. Reach out. Find resources at va.gov slash reach. Hello and welcome again to Oscar Mike Radio. My name is Travis, Marine Corps veteran and your host. Oscar Mike Radio is part of the Hubuzu Network. You can find out more on hubuzu.com. I want to thank my sponsors, Joyce Asak of Asak Real Estate, Army National Guard veteran Mark Holmes of Reapers Detailing and Power Washing, and my supporters, Exceptional Parent Magazine and Quezon Shaving Company. Thank you very much. We're in the September. It's just after Labor Day weekend. Uh, the fall is is going to kick into high gear here in a minute. And I have a special guest with you uh, for us today. Author, filmmaker, writer, uh, lieutenant colonel in the Air Force, Air National Guard. He joins us to talk about his book, This Troubled Ground. Uh, Les Carroll, sir, welcome to Oscar Mike Radio. Thank you, Travis. It's an honor to be here with you. I'm really pumped about this. You wrote this book from a very different perspective. Uh, it's a very interesting story about a side of the military we don't hear a lot about, really. And then you just have a career in, you know, writing, filmmaking, and, you know, other pursuits that you've done in photography. And so I'm really interested to learn more about that. Before we get to all the good stuff, and it's all good, Kind of tell us, you know, a little bit about Les and how he got in the military, and we'll take it from there. Well, I uh, I joined in 1985, and so that was between that was before Desert Storm, and you know, it's kind of peacetime. I I never had the idea that my career would go the way it did, and that the world would go the way it did. Um, you know, in 1985, we were 
still talking about making sure that the Soviets didn't, you know, come into Germany and things like that, and um, or into West Germany. Um, and so, you know, we were we were all about deterrence, you know, air power is deterrence and and that kind of thing. And then I stayed four years in the Air Force, and then I went to um, went to their National Guard. While I was in the Air Force, I had some pretty cool experiences. One of them was the Bob Hope Show came to Pope Air Force Base, and I, I got to run the little media area. So I got to meet Bob Hope and uh, uh, Lucille Ball and Don Johnson and uh, Brooke Shields and Brooke, Brooke Shields when she was still in college. And um, it was, you know, it was a great experience. It was one of those, you know, one of those things you just kind of fall into as a public affairs officer. And um, my boss let me handle all the media stuff at the hangar where the where the celebrities were. So that was a that was a lot of fun. But then after that, I, uh, I went to Germany and then I came back and finished at Charleston Air Force Base and, and then joined the Air National Guard in 1989 and and the the first big thing that happened when i joined the guard or after i joined the guard three weeks after my swearing in hurricane hugo hit the coast of south carolina and at the time when we activated the south carolina national guard i believe it was the largest peacetime activation ever there have been a lot of bigger ones since that time but but i think that was the biggest at the time we activated around seven thousand guardsmen at different times during that uh, that uh, event, and I thought that's kind of how my career was going to be. I, I thought as a National Guard officer that my career was going to be mostly, you know, civil defense, uh, you know, call, being called out for natural disasters and that kind of thing. I didn't, you know, I didn't give much thought to, even though I was in an F-16 unit, we were just training and being prepared in case, you know, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we weren't thinking. Thing. We weren't thinking about Saddam Hussein and right, right. Iraq and Iran and Afghanistan and all that. But then one year after I joined the guard uh, was when um, Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and basically everybody in the military, our lives changed. My unit was very active as an F-16 unit, and um, you know our, our whole focus and our whole direction changed. And and for the rest of my career, it was focused on the Middle East. You, you go through this and people don't talk about the Air Force enough. You, you're the butt of jokes sometimes, but there's a very real threat that the Air Force has created to mitigate. And with the Air National Guard, a lot of people do not appreciate, in my view, the difference between the Air Force and the Air National Guard. Can you kind of educate us a little bit about the differences between the two, because it's a very distinct mission role, what the Air National Guard does, sir. Well, the very, um, the recruiting answer and everything is that the Guard has a dual mission, a state mission and a federal mission. The state mission being to respond to something like a hurricane or tornado, big natural disaster. We do it all the time. I mean, in this country, we're having a lot of hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, um, you know, even some earthquakes and things like that. So they're not, the National Guard is always out there serving and doing that, what we call the state mission, where the governor puts us into action. And then the federal mission, of course, is to be part of the Air Force, part of the Army. And, you know, back when I first joined, we were kind of this sort of augmentation force or this, you know, the second string or something like that. But in Desert Storm, my unit performed admirably. I mean, we were one of the top units in Desert Storm. We were one of the first ones to fly um, into Iraq and, and into Kuwait and drop bombs and 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 do that. So my my particular unit and a lot of Air National Guard units have have developed into and and are recognized as top line units. Um, we have a very experienced unit, the 169th Fighter Wing. We usually can recruit the best active duty pilots that want to get out, join the state, keep flying, and um, you know, maybe become airline pilots or business, you know, business people. And we can usually get the best ones. Um, we're right by Shaw Air Force Base. And when those guys want to get out, 
they come to McIntyre to our base and and apply to get in our unit. So our unit is just full of very, very experienced top top line pilots and maintainers. Did, did you fly? No, I was a public affairs officer. Public affairs. Um, I flew in an F-16 a few times and I flew, I flew a lot. My first, uh, back when I first joined the Air Force, I was in a C-130 unit, flew a lot with that unit. Got to fly a few times with the, uh, with the, in the F-16, just, you know, it's a backseater. And, um, and then I had some harrowing experiences flying in Afghanistan, which I can talk about later when, if you want to ask me the scaredest I ever was in Afghanistan, it wasn't facing the enemy. It was flying in a Chinook across Western Afghanistan, 50 feet off the ground. Well, you know, army aviation is different than, than the air force. Those rotary wing guys are a little out there from what I understand. But that wasn't with the Americans. That was with Italians. I think they're even they're even more they're even more bigger risk takers. I think we just we were just crossing. You know, we were going across Western Afghanistan. There was a you know there was a ground threat possible, so we flew very close to the ground. We had some special forces guys on the ground. I mean, I mean, on the airplane, I don't even know what they were. They were, you know, they could have been Navy SEALs, could have been CIA. I don't know. We had two of those guys on the aircraft. We just stopped and or landed in the middle of nowhere, and they jumped off and disappeared. And then we just took off again. Um, but yeah, that you know that was a that that was that's a story, and I talk about that in the book about you know I I say when I do my presentations that I'm not the American sniper, I'm not the lone survivor, I'm not you know the great late Pat Tillman. I didn't go out there and you know engage the enemy face to face i was a public affairs officer <laughs> but from my book i got you know from that experience i got a more you know a unique story different than those stories of those great heroic warriors well, let's talk about the book and the purpose behind the book because when this show airs it will have been about a year since the book came out and reading about the book and and you know going through it this troubled ground tells a different part of the military experience than you normally do hear from, you know, the big name uh, military veterans or active duty people who have distinguished themselves. This is a very different side of that. So kind of take me into where the idea of the book came from and, you know, what happened when you put the book out, please. Um, I did two Afghanistan deployments and the four month to a four month assignment at Dover Air Force Base at the mortuary. And I always had this question in my mind. If you remember the scene from Saving Private Ryan, where the captain says, How will I ever tell my wife about days like today? That sort of rang in my my head a lot. I was always thinking about that. How, how um, you know, how will I tell my families, my family about and friends about um, you know, being on the ramp at Dover when, you know, when the remains of fallen service members come back or being, you know, on a Chinook flying across Western Afghanistan um, or in a, you know, in a news conference with, you know, with Dan Rather and people like that that had come to Afghanistan to cover, you know, to cover the conflict there. And so that, that question was always in my mind and I always took a lot of notes. Um, I took a lot of notes. I'm a big journal keeper. Um, you know, if I'd have an interesting experience, I would just write it down almost like a little short story. And then eventually all that started to come together. I mean, I, I struggled for a lot of years trying to figure out how that becomes a book, whether it's a memoir, novel. And I had this fictional story that I wanted to tell as well. So I just kind of, you know, I called my book part, you know, part memoir, part novel, um, the publisher said, let's just call it an autobiographical novel. So that's that's what we call it. You start writing the book. Have you ever written before at that scale? Because I'm finding out the hard way that I have the idea, but man, getting it on paper can be challenging because there's the aspect of getting the feeling of what you're trying to convey out there. And you know, you're on the ramp, you're watching this happen, and you're trying to get that feeling into what you've written. You know, what was that like, Gilles? Um, You know, before, or as soon as I got there at Dover, we had to, 
uh, signed a non-disclosure agreement that basically said we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't release the names or, or not, you know, not, they were released, but we didn't, we wouldn't use the names when we weren't supposed to or a lot of details. And I don't remember exactly what was in it. When I got ready to publish the book, I asked them to send me one. They said, we can't find it. So I said, okay, well, I kind of remember it. I'm going to do my best, but I'm going to, but I'm going to tell this story in as much detail as I think I can possibly tell it without um, violating that non-disclosure agreement. I did, um, I didn't use this person's name in the book, but there is one um, fallen Marine that was, I was there for his, his homecoming or his return. And I've since gotten to know his family. I've interviewed him for two documentaries and, and they've told me anytime I want to, I can say his name. And so this is Sergeant Jeremy McQuarrie. He was from uh, Columbus, Indiana. And in the book, I described in detail the day he came home from Afghanistan. And that was sort of the one, the one day I took sort of as the most intense and memorable day and just described it. Um, I, I described other times being on the ramp as well, but that, but that, that day I described and, and, um, and so I didn't use the name Jeremy McQuarrie at the time because I didn't, I didn't know I was going to eventually interview his family and, and get and become close with them and stay in touch with them. But, um, his family knows when, they, when they read that, they know exactly, you know, exactly what I'm describing. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold the book up, not so much as a pitch, but just so people can see this picture, which uh, I don't know if you can see it. That's blurry. So yeah, it's, it's I've got, I got my foreground blurry too, blurry too, I guess. I'll try that. I'll try something with that later. Um, but anyway, it's just a picture of a dignified transfer of the carry team bringing off the, the transfer case. And, you know, I did that a hundred times. We, we always try not to let it get routine. I mean, sometimes it does, unfortunately, where we just go, okay, here we go again. You know, do it just like we did it yesterday. Make sure everything's perfect. Make sure we're all doing, you know, doing our job and being in the right places and everything. I mean, you have to do that as well. But, but the important thing is you can't forget that when you step on that ramp and you see that case coming off that, that in that case is a falling fallen U.S. service member who has given his or her life uh, fighting for our country and that their families are standing right beside you. Right beside you. Yeah. Well, 20 feet, 30 feet away. But still, I mean, you're watching them mm -hmm. experience this, this moment, this moment of pain and loss that will probably never be the same way ever again because yeah. I have to think that once they see this, they know that this is, there's no coming back from this, that, that, that this is oh, yeah. permanent. And and you're, you're not going through it yourself, but you have to relive it all the time with them. How do you keep your, your team and your leadership, you know, focused on the mission of, of, of providing the best experience you can, but you got to share in that pain too, every time. Well, here's the one thing that job is not for everybody. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of great people in the military, but not everybody is cut out and could do that job. You've got to be really compassionate, patient, focused. I mean, you can't, you know, you can't get out there and start daydreaming and forget what you're doing, or you can't, you know, go, well, here we go again, another dignified transfer. You know, I got to get up and be on the ramp at two o'clock in the morning. You know, you can't complain and, let those kinds of thoughts. Well, if if they come into your head, you got to get it. You got to get rid of them and and make sure your actions don't reflect any of that. Um, one this this day I was talking about earlier when Sergeant McQuarrie and three other Marines returned. Um, I had a brand new team. It was toward the end of my time there, and I had volunteered to stay an extra month. And so all the NCOs and the and my deputy had all transitioned out and I had a new team. And, um, you know, that was one of the toughest days. And it was my, you know, it was my 95th or something, but it was their first or second. And so when we got done with that um, and, and, and we were done with the dignified transfer, the media and everybody, the families were all off the ramp. I turned around and my, my deputy, who was a 
a big muscular African American captain who looked like an NFL linebacker. He he had tears streaming down his face, which didn't surprise me. I mean, I cried out there a lot. But you know, and he and then he started apologizing to me, you know, for crying and letting his emotions come out. And I said, man, don't 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 apologize. And you know, there's nothing to be ashamed of. You know, he said, well, I didn't, you know, I didn't keep my bearing. And I said, yes, you did. You you stood right there for 30 minutes, you know, while, while families were, you know, 30, 40 feet away from you wailing in, in agony. And you stood there and, and did your job. And, you know, if if tears streamed down your face, that's fine. You did your job. You held your ground. You stayed, you know, you kept your composure. And and I've said, you know, if if you need to cry, you you can cry. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. So you know, it's just a good example of you know looking at somebody you'd never think you'd see. You know, it's like when you're watching a, a some kind of some NFL star giving a post game interview and he gets emotional or something, and that's kind of how it was. Not not somebody you would think would would cry, but it was emotional, and that was a, that was about the most emotional of all of all the days even for me, but, but again, I had done it, you know, 95 times and it was their first for, for some of them. And it's just, I describe it in detail in the book uh, with the others coming off the plane too. And some of the reactions we heard, you said something about facing the family. I didn't, we didn't face them very much. I usually had my back to them. They were usually off my kind of off my right shoulder because I was I was standing between the families and the media facing and we were all facing the aircraft. So and I heard the families more than I saw them, but I would, you know, I would see them get on and off the bus. And every once in a while when somebody would get on the bus and I was down below the bus, they'd look out the window and we were, you know, we were 10 feet away from each other making eye contact. And and that was, you know, that was meaningful and and um you know sad and heartbreaking as well. Especially when you look up there and there's a 19 or 20 year old widow just, you know, just saw her husband's remains come off an airplane. Two years ago, they were going to the, you know, going to the senior prom in high school. Yeah. It's been about a year since the book came out. What was the reaction to the book as you started getting in people's hands and, you know, what did it bring up anything else in your mind as you started going through, you know, the, the, the book, I thought I don't want to say tour is the right word, but you know, getting the book out there, you know, how did you how did you feel that the book was received? Well, I got um, I had four uh, retired, or three retired general officers who read the book and gave me reviews, and I, and I told them when they when they were when they were willing to read it, I said, don't you know, don't beat around the bush. Say how you feel about the book, and and they did, and they were honest, and they were very complimentary but you know one, one of them said you know that it, it reminded him of his own deployments and his own time in combat and uh, i think one of them said it was it was difficult to read sometimes because because of you know the the thoughts that, that it brought back and quite a few people who served in afghanistan and have read it have told me that um i just recently saw a uh at the time he was a young nco he's a little older now but you know, hadn't seen him in 15 years. And we served together over there in Afghanistan on my first deployment. Um, and he, you know, he he said at first he he was having a hard time reading it. And then he eventually read it and, and very much appreciated it. And I went and saw him and hadn't seen him in 15 years. And it was just like it was yesterday when we were when we were there in Afghanistan together. Um, so the reaction's good. People, um, you know, people who know nothing about the Dover mission, non-military people, keep switching back and forth from Dover to Afghanistan, Afghanistan to Dover. But, um, you know, people that don't know anything about that mission have just, you know, come up to me and said, wow, thanks for, you know, thanks for telling the story. We had no idea, one, what it takes to take care of the fallen and their families, and two, how... Uh, much effort we put into it, the American people and the military put into it. And uh, I think people are very much appreciative of, of that part of it, knowing, learning how we um, take care of the fallen and their families. You also did filmmaking 
and I think some more writing, but let's talk about the filmmaking for a second. Was that just an extension of doing the book or were you, you know, doing film before the book? Um, I've always been doing documentary films. You know, some of them are just little small projects, you know, that we did in our unit, like back in, back in 89 and after Hugo and that big deployment, um, the adjutant general said to us, Hey, I want you to put together a little documentary. And so I started gathering all the material and writing a script and I got a, uh, army guard captain or lieutenant captain that was, uh, he's actually an attorney and he, but he was a part-time, you know, end day soldier. And he edited it. I didn't even know he had that skill, but he was like this really good editor. So we put together this 20 minute documentary and, and, um, you know, so that was my, you know, kind of my first experience is first experience doing that. Um, and then I wrote, I wrote some books back in the mid nineties. And then, uh, in about 2005 or six, my, our wing commander in the air guard unit came to us and said, we want you to do a, our 60th anniversary was coming up. And he, he said, we want, I want you to do a documentary and I want it to be like band of brothers. And I went, Hmm, okay, well, you know, band of brothers made by two of the greatest filmmakers the world has ever known 10 million dollar budget some of the greatest writers i don't, I, I don't I, know so, i should join the air force sir i mean i didn't know you had the budget like that that's no, I'm, no, I'm talking about band of brothers 10 million an oh. episode oh, oh, oh um 10 million an episode and steven spielberg tom hanks and and a lot of great writers that if i just threw the names out most people don't know them but graham yost and you know graham yost wrote the, the screenplay to the movie speed years ago i mean these great writers um, that, that were on that. I'm thinking like, hmm, okay, well, we'll do our best, sir. To, you know, we ended up doing a really good, you know, documentary on the history of our Air Guard unit, and that was in 2006. So then, uh, and then when I, you know, when I got out, when I retired, we did Bringing the Fallen Home, which was based on Dover. That aired nationally on public television, and then I've done three or four more since then that have been more state, you know, state wide projects what what aspect do you enjoy the most about filmmaking um honestly seeing the final result yeah because it it can be tough it's tedious when you especially when you first started and you sit down and you know this interview we're doing we do it you know we do hundreds of hours of it and then it, it you know it can be tedious and so it's just like anything that's like building a house or you know building building anything it's it's tough when you're doing it and then you love seeing the final product and that's sure. you know that's how i am with documentary films or writing books it's sometimes you wonder if the final product is going to be worth it but it it always seems to be well it's just amazing too because when you got started technology was very different back in 2006 software was very different and now uh, there's so many tools you got to keep abreast of, but the it's still the, about the story, isn't it? Though. Oh yeah, yeah. It's always about the story, and when documentaries, I mean, it's about the people. You know, it's about the interviews and their stories. Um, of course, it, it helps to get a lot of good video and photos and everything too. But but you know, documentary films are are all about the characters and the events. So I'm on with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Les Carroll. Uh, U.S. Air Force, U.S. National Guard, and we're talking about his book, This Troubled Ground, and it's a very, very different military story, and, you know, you know, sir, I'm just honored that you, you, you had me check it out and learn more about it, because I'm thinking about it. You went to Afghanistan, you saw what happened over there, then you came back to, you know, this unit, the mortuary unit, and, and we're really, I mean, I'm thinking about it in some cases, depending upon the situation, some of these families, you might be the last active duty or in uniform person they see for a while, ever maybe. And and so there, there is a standard you all have to keep. There is a bearing you have to keep throughout this process. Um, you know, one thing, if we can just diverge a little bit, is a, a lot of people, civilians mainly, ask me, well, was the Afghanistan war worth it? And I, I really, I'm not trying to get political or anything, but but I do wonder sometimes was the cost worth it, or 
was it just not done right? Because it seems like, um, you know, I'm reading with the Taliban trying to get uh, trade open back up and things like that. And I, I don't know. I just don't know. Well, that's a, that's a, a lot of what the book is about. Um, yeah. A lot of it was about my own struggle with, am I making a difference? Am I doing anything worthwhile? Is the world going to be any better? Is Afghanistan going to be any better, you know, because of the year I spent here? Um, and then a lot of the families, you know, they wanted, you know, they want hope. I mean, that was, if they lost a loved one, that's all they've got left is the hope that their loved one died for something. And I think, I think families, you know, most of them that I talk to feel that way after the withdrawal in 2021, I think a lot of people lost that hope. Um, I certainly lost a lot of the, you know, the hope I had that because I, I had a lot of engagement with um, young, uh, educated Afghans, had a lot of engagement with, women working, you know, working in the media there. And and so we were, you know, one of one of my takeaways was, you know, that you know, you come home here and you see all these, you know, great professional, successful women journalists. And you think, you know, now maybe they got a chance, the women of Afghanistan have that chance to achieve those kinds of careers. And um and I saw that a lot because I was out working with the Afghan media. I went to a lot of Afghan TV stations, radio stations, um, and saw saw Afghan women uh, pursuing careers in journalism. And that was very much, you know, that was very uh, inspirational to me, to me. We'd drive down the street, we'd see young Afghan girls going to school. Um, we'd see Afghan women on the, you know, going to university. And so, that was very, uh, you know, that was very inspirational. Um, so, you know, we probably have lost a lot of that after 21, after the withdrawal of 2021. And, and actually I was about ready to publish the book right before that withdrawal. And then I, and then that happened. And then I went, I don't know if I have a book anymore because my message is kind of diluted a message of hope. I don't know if it's there anymore. So I wrote a epilogue, um, I talked to a lot of Gold Star families. I talked to people who lost, um, I guess they would still be considered Gold Star families, but there was a, um, a young woman from the embassy, a young diplomat that was killed. And I, I had corresponded with her father um, and I wanted to know how he felt about it. And he, you know, he wasn't happy with the withdrawal, but he didn't, he didn't um, feel any different about his daughter's service. He, he, she was the, she was killed working on opening a school for Afghan boys and girls, and that's how she was killed. And so, you know, he said, I don't, you know, I'm not going to let the way it ended tarnish my memories of my daughter and the fact that she was doing what she loved to do. Her, you know, her life's mission was to help people and try to make their lives better. Yeah. And um, so he actually, I would actually was using her as a character. And I, and I actually got in touch with him and asked him or told him I was doing that, asking him if it was all right. And he said, why don't you just use a real name? Because I put a fictional name. And he said, why don't you use a real name? And I said, if, if that's OK, I will. And he goes, yes, I, just use her real name. And then it and then at the end. So in the end, I, you know, when I was talking about different characters and people, I said, you know, this is a real person. Um, and uh, Ann Smettinghoff is what her name. And um you know, he said, you know, he just said, use her real name, please let people know who she was and, and what kind of person she was and how she died and that she died doing what she believed in. And, and so I used her real name in the book, one of the few where I actually used her real name. What's next for this book? It's been about a year, almost a year, you know, when this uh, show airs, you run through a gamut of emotions that you experienced personally and you've seen the pain and suffering of others as they lost their loved ones are you are you going to follow up with anything else you know in the written word or are you looking at another film project well i have actually just finished the first draft of my next novel um and talking to the publisher about that that you know that'll be a year from now for you know before it's published you know comes out 
So I'm going to keep, you know, I'm going to keep marketing this book. And, and I mean, I would love to see this book made into a movie or, you know, I, if I had that kind of connection, if you do, let me know. I'm, be sure to pass it on to your filmmaker friends in Hollywood. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm, yeah, I mean, I still, sometimes I think had hey, the book's been out a year, we hadn't sold as many copies as I thought we would, et cetera, et cetera. But being out for a year isn't that long. And so I'm actually relaunching, sort of relaunching my efforts with this book, with the one year anniversary of the book coming out. So um, I'm going to keep, you know, I'm going to keep going out there. I'm going to keep going to libraries and I'm going to keep working on it. And I'm going to, you know, I hope that this book, you know, maybe could become a movie one day. Well, speaking of the book and, and, you know, the book is called This Troubled Ground and ladies and gentlemen, I'll have the links to, uh, you know, Lieutenant Colonel Carroll's website and Oscar Mike Radio website post and other places. How can people purchase the book, contact you, or just, you know, see what you're up to, stay in touch? Well, I mean, as, as in most websites, there's a, you know, there's a contact page at the end and, and people can get in touch with me. And I answer those because I don't, you know, I don't get a ton of, of comments. So I always answer them. They come directly to my email and then I just email people directly back. So they can contact me through my website, which is lescarol.com, which is just my name, lescarol.com. Um, the books, you know, the books available at Amazon and, you know, all the, all the booksellers and retailers. Um, it's in about three or 400 public libraries across the country. I've been really working hard to try to get it into libraries. I've spoken at a lot of libraries and I want people to be able to get the book and, and read it without always having to buy it. Um, I want people to buy it, but you know, I don't want to go talk at a lab, public library and tell people they got to buy the book to get it. I want the library to have it. So, um, you know, I've been trying to get it out to public libraries a lot too. The term is called dignified transfer. And, and you know, one I think it's important for Americans to understand that there truly is a cost to the liberties and freedoms that we enjoy and continue to enjoy. And I think more light needs to be shed on that. But also you, you, you decide to tell the story and you, and you talk about in your book, when it hit you that this story needed to be told. A lot of veterans tell me, hey, no one's really interested in my story. No one will be, you know, interested in hearing what I have to say. But you took your experience and made it relatable to people on an emotional level. Do, do you feel that, that veterans could do more to let people know what they do and how they did it, sir? Yeah, I mean, a lot of veterans have written and write books, and they're and, and that's good. I mean, um yeah, there's some really good books out there, yeah. really good movies out there, you know, mo and, you know, I mean, almost always based on true stories, but yeah, I think veterans need to continue to tell their stories. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to still do a World War II story. I think um, my brother-in-law's father had an amazing story and he told me a little bit about it. And one day I'm going to try to see if I can dig up all my notes and, and do that story. Because of course, World War II veterans are are um, leaving us every day, and eventually we're not going to have any more. So I'm going to keep I'm going to keep telling I'm going to try to tell that story as well. Um, but yeah, I just think people just need to keep telling stories, and they're always more interesting than fiction. Um, always, the real life stories are way more interesting than a story that you try to make up most of the time. All right. Last question. Well, I, I got one and a half questions, sir. I ask every Air Force, Air National Guard personnel. Uh, I have to know, did you ever go through Barksdale Air Force Base during your time in the service? I didn't. Okay. I, no, 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 I know no. where it is. I don't think I've ever been there. I, I joined the Marine Corps from Shreveport, Bossier, and, you know, I got to tour the air base. They had the open house where they bring everybody in and yeah, I I didn't appreciate how good that place was until I got to some Marine Corps place. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, the Air Force okay. does it does it right. Second thing is, sir, should we retire the A10? Yeah, I've heard. Different, <laughs> I've heard. 
Oh, I That's funny that. that you should ask because one of my former, uh, I think he's my commander, but he was our vice wing commander. His son is an A-10 pilot. He was a he was a great um, F-16 fighter pilot, and his son is an A-10 pilot right now. So I don't know. I don't know, but it's interesting that, I mean, I get, I don't know. I mean, the A-10, I guess, still has its, has its purposes. To be honest with you, if I, if I didn't know that a few people were flying it and I wouldn't even know that we still had it because it's so old. It is old. I mean, I mean, it's it's older than both of us, but it, it's it's a well. The B fifty two is older than both of us by yeah, a lot. Yeah, B fifty two is old. I mean, our F sixteens are old. Right, right. I mean, when we got our F when we got this model of F sixteens in our unit back in around late nineties, I think, or maybe right at the beginning of right, maybe right after desert, or right after uh, I can't remember if it's before or after nine eleven, but you know, they're 93, 94, 95 models. And we, you know, those those were new, you know, and they're still kind of new for F-16s. Wow. But I don't know, the A-10, I don't know. All right, all right, fair enough. I mean, no right If I'm ever there. on the ground and I and I see one flying over to protect me, I'll be glad we have them. But Absolutely. I'm a little old now, so I shouldn't happen. But but uh, I don't know. Hopefully, hopefully. Well, you know, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Carroll, it has just been a, a pleasure and honor to hear this perspective from you about, the dignified transfer what that means and you know i'm going to have the links to uh this troubled ground in the website post i encourage you to check it out if you go to your local library and ask for it you know maybe they'll get it for you but it's a good read it really brings a whole human side to the military experience that kind of doesn't get told a whole lot and sir i just want to thank you for your time and i appreciate you coming on to talk with me I, you know thank you. thank you and i appreciate you standing by the local library because that is the best way to get it in is for a patron with a library card absolutely to go there and ask and go there and ask for it so let's help uh lieutenant colonel carroll celebrate his one year anniversary of publishing this book let's continue to support veteran uh, authors uh filmmakers and other creators because uh, we have amazing stories to tell and sir, as we say in Oscar Mike Radio, we're Mission Flight. Thank you for coming on. Thank you. Appreciate it, Travis. Remember, on a teach is our mission. We care about it. We do it every day. But I think there are things that just hit you and give you a reason to go on. The theme for our 2024 for Roots Across America is live with purpose. It just seemed to fit in with the vows of the wreath, the 10 attributes that we feel represent our United States military. And I thought, what a great opportunity to put those two things together and show our kids through how we act, some of the things that can make their lives better, their communities better, and by doing that, the country better. For me, live with purpose, I think, is a, it's a mindset. Set some guidelines and then go out and purposefully make life different, make a change. It's an opportunity to set an example. Thank you for listening and watching Oscar Mike Radio, where our active duty service members and veterans are in action and the mission is in flight. Oscar Mike Radio is an oversized load, co to one production. If you are a veteran or know a veteran who needs help, please dial 988 and press 1 for the Veterans Crisis Line.